you are currently the Professor Emeritus at VETS. You are an honorary professor at UP and an extraordinary professor at UWC, at University of Western Cape. Okay, we are back at it again. And today my channel is getting baptized. Um, I'm hosting a professor for the first time on the channel, and hopefully I'm going to have a lot of professors. You're baptizing the channel, uh, Prof. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've, I've, been, I, I've been reading, actually I've been reading a lot about you since I was in undergrad. Um, and I remember when I got into honors and one of the things that I brag about is that I was lectured by you, <laughs> you know, so when I got into my honors, um, and I get into class and I remember we were attending group theory and there you were, I was so starstruck, you know, I was just like, how this person that I've been reading a lot about here is the person lecturing me. <laughs> didn't show <laughs> yeah so no i had to contain it i had to con otherwise i was gonna fail <laughs> yeah otherwise i was gonna fail but i was i was very starstruck because um one of the things that i've always been passionate about is leadership and when i was doing my undergrad i would read a lot about people like you people like prof and stuff like that so i feel like even when i was preparing for this i was like where do i start with the profile because your profile is quite long and quite there's a lot of things i think the profile alone can be an entire segment just reading the profile alone you know and the good thing about you guys is that your academic cv is there online anyone can read it and can yeah. see it that, that's true because i mean from time to time one gets invited to either be a speaker and you are asked for your bio and uh, these things whatever you put on paper which is not on paper i mean anything that is digital it's highly unlikely that it will end up being on the web so one one year one has to be precise about oh. things that you say because they will be available beyond uh, the uh, people that you think you are writing for Oh, by the way, one correction. I think when I looked at the YouTube, uh, you said that I'm the vice president. My term as vice president of the International Mathematical Union ended just about two months ago in December. So I'm, I'm, I'm the former vice president oh. of the International Mathematical Union. There were elections last year for the next executive. Oh, I see. I see. I see. I hope you would have been elected as president, eh? That, was, that, was, that would have been good for us. No, I'm old. I'm old <laughs> now. I want to slow down. <laughs> uh, yeah. So today I have uh, Professor Lois Onongwa, um, who, um, you'll correct me because a lot of these things, you know, a person like you is Googleable. You just go to Google, and he, I even saw on Wikipedia there. I read a lot on on Wikipedia yeah. and stuff. So you know, on the internet, maybe some things might be misspelled or anything. So you'll correct me when I'm wrong. Um, so you are a fellow of the Royal Society of South Africa, member yes. of the Academic of Science of South Africa, yes. and like you are saying, the former vice president of the International Mathematics Union. Yes, and you also served as the chairperson of the National Research Foundation. Yeah. And, um, you know, former vice chancellor of VETS. Yes. Um, uh, and, uh, and I mean, uh, administration also, you were, at some point you were the dean at the uh, University of Western Cape. Yes. And then uh, head of department at some time at the University of Fort Hare. And, uh, and, and the list goes on. And um, you matriculated as the top students. You know, those students, one of the things that I always look forward for when the matric results come out is uh, when NG, uh, the Minister of uh, Basic Education, is going to announce the results and you're going to have the top students there. Because for some reason, I always have a top students who come out on TV in my class. I don't know how it works now. Uh, because whenever the results are released, then you, you, you'd have information about 
student who's the, who's top in X, top in Y. But at the time that we were doing metric, there were separate examination boards for the different racial groups. So there was a, I mean, we fell under the Department of Boundary Education or whatever, it had different names. So then the body that was administering the metric results for Africans, in that year I had the best marks. Oh, and um, did you get into be on TV like this one's go on TV like the current top metric they go on TV or because that time it was during apartheid I don't think they would have afforded us that. That's that's a, <laughs> that's a funny question, but of course I mean the history. I was thinking about the history of this. Uh, I finished metric in 1972, and. TV stations, I mean, t t TV programs in South Africa were only introduced in 1976, 1977. So the answer is no, because there was no TV then at all. <laughs> so we relied cool. on radio and music. Wow. Videos. Wow. Okay. And then you went to Oxford. Um, well, you started at uh, University of Fort Air. And you did up until your master's and after that you got the Rhodes Scholarship and then you went to Oxford in 1978. We're going to talk more about your experiences there and uh, maybe to people who want to go and study abroad and stuff. Um, but I wanted to start here. You are currently the Professor Emeritus at VETS. You are an honorary professor at UP and an extraordinary professor at UWC, at University of Western Cape. Sometimes students in class, in my classes, they would mistakenly call me prof. And I would always bring them to order. That, guys, you don't know that this title is very expensive. You don't just throw it around, you know? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so maybe when we start, maybe for the benefit of my audience, how does one become a prof? It goes from university to university, but by and large, uh, one, I mean, by that I mean each university has its own requirements that in order for, to be considered either to apply or to be promoted, you need to meet these requirements. Um, maybe just generic uh, requirements for most universities would be you must have at least a PhD in that discipline. But I must qualify that by saying there are certain disciplines like accounting, maybe, let's say the professional disciplines where a doctorate is not a requirement. So a minimum requirement would be a doctorate. Um, there would be a specification of the length of service in academia, teaching at a university. And I would say maybe at least 10 years uh, of, because remember that there are different levels. Your entry level would be a lecturer, and then you get promoted to a senior lectureship, and then associate professor, and then a full professor. And on average, one spends about five years at each of these levels. Uh, but of course, there are people who rise quickly through the ranks. So minimum number of years as an academic and your academic track record, which would include the number of publications uh, that you have, that have appeared, uh, either as a single author or as a co-author. Uh, in certain cases, the number of students you have supervised at different levels, a master's, PhD, um, in the last maybe decade, universities would require one to have a teaching portfolio. Uh, at what level have you taught and uh, supervision of students? So that those would be the, the expected requirements, I would say, across the university system in South Africa. Oh, 
Oh, I see. I see. So, and it takes quite a long time. So, I mean, now I see even on social media, they will just be calling someone a prof. And I'm like, hey, guys, hey, this, uh, this is a long journey. Yeah? <laughs> 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 you know, you know, you know, there was a, there, there was a debate I saw, um, and, and maybe you can attest to it because you, you have so much experience in this. Um, you know, there are honorary doctorates, you know, honorary PhDs yeah. mm-hmm. um, that are given to people. Mm-hmm. Are those people, are they supposed to be given the title doctor or it is only by that institution? Because I saw there was a debate on Twitter some other day about that to say that, that this honorary doctorate, uh, some people are like, no, they, they are not deserving to be called doctors everywhere. They should only be called doctors in the institution that they were provided that honorary doctorate from. Very good question, in fact, and, and, and what you have described is the, uh, the different views about an honorary doctorate. Um, and also, it depends on the university that awards it. I mean, specifically at this when I was there, and I'm sure this has not changed, is that the person that we were awarding an honorary doctorate to, as you just described, is that they were not allowed to use that title other than in communication between themselves and this university. But it could be that another university does not prescribe that. And therefore, because one has been awarded an honorary PhD, then they call themselves doctor. In fact, there's a related thing, again, going back to the to the comment you made about people on social media and other platforms saying that some people are called prof. There are instances where universities would um, uh, designate or appoint somebody in an honorary position uh, or a visiting professorship. So these are these would be titles that are time limited that maybe you are teaching for a short period of time, three months, six months, a year, that's not important. Um, But again, uh, one is not allowed to call themselves a a professor once that designation has lapsed. Uh, But again, uh, because somebody may be a sometime when that was valid was called prof then that continues even beyond the appointment and they don't find the need to correct people and say look i'm no longer in that position therefore i no longer qualify to be called prof and, uh, yeah at this uh, i think when i first arrived around about 2001 2002 um the university created a designation of an adjunct professor. Uh, This this would be somebody who really is not an academic per se, but has got expertise in in a particular area that the university feels students should be exposed to. Uh, This applies mainly in the professional disciplines. Let's say somebody is a highly respected specialist, orthopedics, psychiatry, whatever, and they are appointed just to teach maybe whatever, it could be anything as little as six lectures, and then they are appointed as adjunct professor. But then now some of them drop the adjunct and they say I'm professor so-and-so, and they continue using that title even when that short-term appointment has ended. No, the word professor is nice. Eh? It, it it commands respect. I I see why people would use it even afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so the word emeritus, what does it mean? Because you also have your professor emeritus. Yes. So I got so much interested in the word emeritus. Does it mean retired? Yeah, by and large, it's used in that context. Um, again, different universities have got different policies. Uh, you must have been, to be called an emeritus professor, you must have been a professor 
for at least 10 years. And then you uh. retire. I don't know whether retirement is a requirement. Um, and then and then you are designated professor emeritus. But there could be exceptional cases where maybe you have not served for 10 years. Um, now, one or two universities use that term from vice chancellor emeritus. Uh, I think the previous vice chancellor of UCT um, is known as Professor Emeritus. Um, yeah, he's somebody who has served in that position for a certain period of time and then stepped down. Uh, and then you, called, you are called Emeritus, Professor Emeritus, Vice Chancellor. I don't know if there's Emeritus President. <laughs> No, I think in the political arena, once you have been president, they just call you president because yeah, 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 you yeah, see right. them referring to yeah. the former presidents as presidents. And you are an extraordinary professor at UWC, University of Western Cape. Then what is an extraordinary professor? I, I don't know. Uh, I think <laughs> different universities use different titles. So I would say in the case of UWC, oh. An honorary professor, they use the term extraordinary professor. So it's somebody who, who is not a full-time employee of the university. And I mean, if you're not a part-time university, you're not on a paid position. The same as honorary professor. You don't receive remuneration uh, for whatever you do with or for the university. Uh, I know that at, at University of the Western Cape, uh, is called extraordinary professor or professor extraordinary. My 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 gut feeling is that that is equivalent to being an honorary professor. Oh, I see. Um, <clears throat> Prof, you have been in academia for almost your entire life. I like to believe. Uh, you've never been to corporate or to, no. you've never worked anywhere besides academia. Am Except I right? at the university. I went to university as a first year and I never left. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So my, my whole That's a very really nice way to put it. <laughs> is that of a university. In fact, sometimes people say that. No, you saw there's a big world out there. <laughs> It's not only about universities. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, one of the things that I always get, um, I remember even when I decided to get into academia, um, a lot of people close to me, like my family, didn't get it. Like, they were like, what is this? You're getting to academia? And you also, even I remember when I was doing my honors, my peers, there used to be this corporate who would come and do um, presentations and everyone wanted to go there because, you know, it's corporate. It has this luxury vibe to it and stuff. So a lot of people didn't, they were like, even, even now, when I go to class, I still get students who ask me to say, but why did you choose this? Because I suppose a lot of people who are in academia, they are perceived to be older people. So they're like, you're still young and stuff like that. So I want us to talk about a career in academia, you know, for people who want to join this career. And I want us to debunk all the myths that are there, you know. But to start off with, according to you as... um a professor, as someone who has been in the helm of institutions and have been in academia for years, how does somebody have a successful career in academia? I mean, initially, you ask the question about how does one become a professor? And I would say that because a professorship is really the pinnacle of the academic ladder, uh, one could say one measure of being successful in an academic career is to go through the ranks until you reach the level of professor. Um, and therefore, 
the criteria, generic criteria that I gave earlier on are the things that are required for one to reach the level of, because note that not everybody reaches that level. In some cases, there are people who don't get out of the lectureship category, okay? So success in academia, one aspect of it is to reach the top as far as um, the academic ranks are concerned. But of course it does not um, end there. Once you reach the level of professor, then you build, your goal is to build a reputation as a good academic. So now this reputation is amongst your peers. Uh, being a mathematician is uh, how highly respected are you as a mathematician? Or how highly respected are you as a physicist, as a chemist and so on? And by and large, that reputation depends on the research that you produce. Um, you could be a professor, but people really are not that impressed with, um, let's say, the research that you're doing. It, it happens, right? Um, I mean, let me give an extreme example, which, which uh, people can relate to. Uh, you, you, you know, this was a while ago, I think in the 90s, that Andrew Wiles solved Fermat's theorem which was famous last theorem, uh, which nobody had actually given a proof of for more than 300 years. And many people had attempted to establish whether famous last theorem was true or false, and nobody had actually done it. So in 1994, 95, he managed to do that. And I mean, he earned worldwide reputation for that piece of work. So, but very few people can, can produce those kind of outstanding uh, breakthroughs in mathematics. So to be successful then, um, let me go back to that, is really to earn a reputation for the quality of your research. And then the other aspect is the students that you produce. Are you training young people who themselves become good mathematicians or good physicists or good economists? So also based on, uh, you know, um, Professor Bele uh, has produced 50 PhDs. And, and some of those PhDs have ended up teaching at reputable universities. And, and, and recently, well, maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago, when the need to raise money for your research uh, was recognized uh, because governments could not afford to support people at the required level, then the ability to raise funding for your research was seen as a proxy for the quality of the research that you're doing because others were prepared to invest in your work. So again, that's a measure of success that people outside of academia, let's say uh, in, um, let's say ESCOM is looking for a solution to something and then they approach professor so-and-so in engineering and say that, uh, can you provide us with a solution to this, which requires fundamental research, okay? Uh, so then you earn a, re a reputation that you really are the, one of the top experts in a particular area. Maybe I should have started with this. Um, <clears throat> for the benefit of the audience, what does a career in academia really entails? Uh, yeah, remember that, okay, the way I look at it, 
is not universities uh, educational institutions. Of course, I mean, yeah, it's not, it's not like an opinion, it's a fact. Universities are part of um, the cluster of educational institutions. Yeah? Now you can look at the pipeline of, uh, of, of educational institutions. Uh, there's preschooling, uh, you need people who teach at that, at that level. Uh, you need, um, there are people who teach at the, now I can't remember the technical names for the phases. Uh, primary school, when, when, uh, when I was growing up, there was primary school. There are primary school teachers. Don't know now whether it's called phase one. Then there are people who teach at the secondary level. Um, junior, secondary, and then there are people who teach at high school. And then there are people who teach at uh, colleges, uh, vocational uh, colleges. And then there are people who teach at, 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 um, at universities. So one then should basically say that academics are teachers at universities. But there is a requirement for people who teach at all these institutions. Otherwise, the educational system would not function well. Right? It, it just so happens that um, there are certain things which are not taught at other levels, but are taught at universities. Like, for instance, if you want to become a medical doctor, you need to go to university. If you want to become an engineer, okay, you don't need to go to uh, probably, I mean, the te technicians and so on. So universities <clears throat> are accredited to teach certain programs and award certain degrees. So being an academic then is to teach at an educational institution known as a university, which is accredited to offer certain programs. I mean, there is a student, I remember, who once asked me this question, and then <clears throat> the question was, how do you know that you are meant for academia? Like, uh, uh, do you need to have certain skills and certain, I don't know, maybe like research, and that's when you'd be like, okay, I, I think I'm meant for this, or I'm meant for academia? Who I, I, I don't know. I think it, 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 it varies from individual to individual. <laughs> Um, there are people who have got an eloquent way of describing the difference between teaching at a university and teaching maybe at the primary school level. But I mean, uh, uh, one is not saying that teaching in a particular way is only exclusive to universities. But for me, one of the things I find appealing even now is that you are teaching things at the frontier, right at the edge of what is known about that discipline. And you kind of know that there are certain aspects of what you're teaching which are still open. I'm now I'm talking about mathematics. Um, and, and therefore it's to excite your students to look for the answers to questions for which no answers are yet known. So that's one thing. So there's something about, something about what is contemporary about that discipline, uh, what is contemporary about about physics at that time, or economics, or mathematics, and so on. Um, and then, of course, in certain instances, maybe questioning the premise on which as this is knowledge is founded. Okay. Uh, you could, I mean, for instance, in mathematics, with your topology, uh, one of the things that people do is that 
this fact that is known for this class of mathematical structures, can it be extended to hold to a broader class? Okay, so it's, it's, it's asking the question as to what are the limits of applying this, what is known about this area of mathematics? Can it be pushed further and still hold? So that, that, that does. Whereas maybe, I, I need to be very careful here that I'm not saying that is the case. Um, maybe, let's say at high school, um, one was taught how to factorize x squared minus y squared is equal to x minus y into x plus y. Okay, So maybe there was a focus on how you do things. There was a focus more on facts that you needed to remember. Okay? Uh, whereas at university, especially at the higher level, is to, can you push what is known uh, further? Can you push the boundaries further? 